And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of a po of no, one joke about the initials, I think. Okay, it. Yeah, I'm I'm actually uh second life is in computer science, so it's uh not and I'm Common reference. I am. I hope that I hope that at least one person has re has referenced the IT crowd in in your yeah. in your particular group. Good. Then there are people. Yeah. In the culture. They <laughs> since they reference a show that that fe that actually feels like nerds, unlike 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 a certain sitcom that claims to be that claims to be nerd adjacent, which I won't mention here. Um. But with the, with that said, I'd like to open up at the humble beginnings, in a sense. Walk me through your first introduction to tabletop games, and what was it that made it stick? Um, I may or may not actually remember my first introduction to tabletop games, because uh, I was... I mean, I've been playing pretty much as long as I can remember with my dad in some way or another. Because um, he, he got into D&D, you know, way back in the 70s and 80s, and so uh, then kind of passed that on to me when I was very young, um, where, you know, it was a very n not strictly by the rules form of the game, but, um, you know, as I got older, we introduced more of the rules, so I've kind of always been playing tabletop games in some form. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, with... With that in with that in mind, um, was apothe was would it be correct of me to say to say that apotheosis is meant to be a kind of universal fantasy approach, not a full universal game, but more of built for any any potential kind of um, fantasy um, setting? Yeah, um, I wanted it to be very uh, setting agnostic, so to speak. Um, so yeah, it, it pretty much works with anything you want to put into it. Um, some far way down the down the line, I do have uh, some plans to try and uh, actually add a expansion to the game that'll just convert the system to a uh, sci-fi setting as well. Reaction to things that I had experienced with fantasy. Role playing games, uh, otherwise, um, uh, and you know things that I had some grievances with. Uh, that that was doing really a, a large part of the inspiration behind it, but um, a lot of it also came from just things that I sort of uh, me and, and the the sort of co designer of the game uh, thought of as just sort of better ways of doing things, um, like the simplified. Stat systems, for example, um, is kind of something that was a little bit reactionary in the sense that a lot of games you, you use your stats and your modifiers and you keep these two separate numbers and only one of them really has relevance. Mm -hmm. So we just simplified that down to one number and then you can just apply it in different ways um, instead of having it have a strange effect on some other number that then is actually used. So. There, a lot of there's less simplification in ways like that um, to just kind of make it more accessible for one, and mm -hmm. also uh, cut down on some things that I had always found a little aggravating. Um, 
But then there was also things that I just sort of had always wanted to see. Uh, this is stuff like one of the playable species in the game uh, called the Neurocyte is a uh, basically a brain parasite that controls a host body. Um, so, you know, that was sort of something where I just hadn't really seen it in tabletop role-playing games, and I always thought it would be something that would be fun to do. And so that was sort of uh, less reactionary and more inspired by my want to have done it. Um, so, yeah. Now, even even with that, you meant you mentioned um, com- you mentioned coming up on um, on ga- on ga- on gaming in the se- in the seventies and eighties. Um, were you more were you mostly a once a one system guy for a lot of that time, or did you experiment around with other systems before you d- before you started creating? Um, apotheosis. Um, I my my biggest background is definitely Dungeons and Dragons. Um, that's definitely what I've spent the the most time with. Uh, I've dipped my toe into some other stuff, and I've definitely did uh, you know beyond what I've I've played. I've also done you know research on other systems mm-hmm. in the process of creating this one to see you know the kinds of things that people liked and didn't. But uh, yeah, my my I've definitely played D and D disproportionately to anything else. I've I've dipped my toe a little bit into a couple other things, like this. Uh, one of the more recent ones uh, was this uh, pretty small system called like Last Arc. Um, some other stuff like that, but yeah. Now, with that with that said, let's um, let's get let's. I think we I think given the fact that this is a universal game, I think the first thing we need to establish. is is the core system where all roads lead to Rome to is given the fact that you mentioned a strong backbone with Dungeons and Dragons is um D20 the primary um random re- random resolution setup yeah yeah it's a uh, your your it's the normal uh D4 through D20 um set for dice yeah D4 through D20 but um for the but for the most part, you're going to be using D20 when it comes to the majority of the majority of rolls, and compare that to a um, target number. Yeah, yeah. So the it's it's a normal like uh, D20 saving throws and checks type thing. Yeah, and and attack rolls as well. Mm-hmm. Also D20. Now with the, with that in mind, um. Because of the fact that th- that this is a system that's designed to accommodate a variety of fantasy settings, um, not all fantasy settings have their rules um, created equal, and there's plenty of subgenres to go about when it comes to um, fantasy settings. Um, how do you, how do you how do you accommodate how do you accommodate the um, way the rules might change if someone's doing say. Um, dark fantasy, or do, or doing st- or doing steampunk, or doing sword and sorcery, and so, and so on. Uh, yeah, it's a great question because uh, so that's sort of one of the big things that we're striving for is is building in that flexibility into the system, mm-hmm. um, and it's it's definitely accomplished through through a variety of methods. Um, one of the ways we do this is to have some inbuilt flexibility in the rules uh, where there's you know like optional rules so to speak where uh, you you can alter how it works a little bit and then there's a little bit of an explanation in the rule book as to how that'll change the mechanics and make it better suit different settings um, like you know for example because uh, pe- people people uh, d d for example people often try to jam it into very various settings uh, where it's really built almost exclusively for a high fantasy setting, and so there's a lot of issues with doing that. Um, and we are trying to kind of address a lot of that. So, uh, you know, just, just one example of that would be uh, in Dark Vision. Um, uh, Dark Vision in D&D is, makes it kind of difficult to play something that's a little more intense, more grimdark style, because it's limiting your player's vision is one of the big ways to do it, and you don't want to just always be using magical darkness, because it's uh, a little tiresome for your players. Mm-hmm. Um, so to to create that you know intense darkness limiting vision, uh, we have an ab- we have a, an optional rule that you can add in for 
uh, absolute obscurity, which is essentially uh, an added level of rear and owl's vision where while they can see better in the dark, they still need some amount of light. or they're equally blind. So, um, and then that's, so then we have this system for absolute obscurity so that, you know, if you want to play something like a grimdark setting, you can, you can just introduce that rule into it and it'll help smooth over a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Um, in addition to that, we kind of built the system to accommodate the, the flexibility of different, like, however much magic you want to introduce into the game, um, is, is more easily justifiable um, in the sense that, uh, you know, it's kind of playing things like D&D or Pathfinder with lower, lower magic available in the world is kind of strange because magic is so easy to get from a player character perspective. Um, like, you know, you, you have magic when you're, you start the game, so why doesn't everyone... Um, and there's a little bit of a disconnect between the player experience and the narrative of the game in that sense. Mm -hmm. So to kind of help smooth that over for Apotheosis, uh, we kind of just add a little bit more background into the requirements of magic, right? So basically, um, it's a little more clear that it requires you to have put in effort. Like, you, you need to know certain... Uh, what we call them as runic languages. Um, and so you have to have learned a runic language, which, you know, requires some some points from your, your character. Um, it doesn't just tap and based on your class. So mm -hmm. because you're, you're choosing your path, it's more easily justifiable for a, a game master to say why most people haven't done that. If, if education is less available in your in your world, it stands to reason that it's much more difficult for any random person to have attained magic, and therefore it's less common. Mm -hmm. um, so, that was kind of a long explanation of that, but uh, there's... I think it's... that's. I'll stop it there. <laughs> now, with a... a given, the, given the... Now, one particular... Uh, when you're dealing with A, a game that's D and D that's D and D adjacent. Um, e even if, even if the even if the set even if the type of fantasy is far more wide, is how is how are you han how are you handling um how are you handling classes? Are you going full classless? Are you going archetype? Or are you or are you going um are you going completely uh class free so it's it's entirely based on builds so to speak which is you just you choose your abilities um as you as you your character uh progresses so um class is instead of some like abstracted notion of something like experience points uh your your attributes themselves increase as you use them so the more that you're that you're making uh strength checks and strength savings throws and things like this um the more that your you will your strength will increase so um as your so so, so the, the more you use your strength the stronger you get the more you use your intelligence the smarter you get kind of things like that um, which both makes it a little bit more realistic and also lets you sort of create these uh, synergies between your abilities. Like if you build strength and intelligence or strength and charisma, you end up with these different semi-character archetypes. Mm -hmm. But then depending on what abilities you choose within that, you can end up with widely varying different character builds. So... Now, 
with that with that in with that in mind, um, one other question that I ask is a bit that I often ask is a bit of a corollary to to the ma to the magic question is in is in regard to how um, non magical c characters are treated since obviously in D and D even with all the advancements over the years. Um, Linear Warriors Quadratic Mages is still somewhat of a thing. Right. Um, so I'm curious, I'm, I'm curious how that kind, how that kind of thing is addressed. Is there still, is there going to be means for non-martial characters to have a little bit of action variety? Uh, yeah, so that was another thing that, um, one of the decisions we made that was, you know, kind of reactionary to D&D, &D, uh, was to try and give, uh, non-magic users a lot more capability in what they could do, uh, a lot more options. Um, so, you know, for starters, this is things like adding, um, you, you've got more more viable options in combat, more things that'll really have an effect. Because, uh, you know, in D&D, in &D you can do something like, you could choose to grapple a creature, or you could choose to try and trip them or shove them, but these things don't, don't have a benefit that is that outweighs just attacking. So you would always you're always kind of incentivized to just attack because the other options have bit just less effect. Um, they're just not as good. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the appearance of options. Uh, we wanted to get rid of that and, and make those things something that could actually have an effect on the combat um, and something that players would be incentivized to do. Uh, and this is done both by letting, making it easier for players to tailor their build to something where they could say attack and shove or grapple in the same turn, uh, but also making things like uh, grappling have higher elements of reward, um, but also with that some higher elements of risk. So, uh, I mean, I, maybe I should get into this here because it kind of gets into the whole Lumina system and everything that we use, mm -hmm. which can turn into kind of a long explanation. Uh, but basically... If you grapple a creature, you you gain the potential to have to, to kill them outright. Um, if someone else were to attack them, because it, it essentially restrains both of you. But then through some collaboration, you could you could kill them far more quickly. But you put yourself in the same position of vulnerability. Um, so it lets players kind of strategize and work together to a greater extent, while also giving you know martial classes, so to speak, um, more legitimate options during combat um and then we've also done things like adding mechanics for doing charging damage and stuff like that so you've got to have another element of strategy to your use of melee fighters and, and whatnot um yeah now with that with that kind of thing with that kind of thing in mind um whenever you have a universal or universal adjacent game there's often the there's often the risk run for um what you could call analysis paralysis um or or ju or just pe or just people um just people being a bit being a bit overcautious about what about what choice to make when there when there's so many potential options that they have in front of them mm. how do you, how do you um how do you mitigate that um, yeah, so part the, in my experience, the biggest thing, the, the biggest problem with, with something like analysis paralysis, and I think you, you can see a little bit of this issue in games, uh, maybe like Pathfinder, where you can have all of these, these tons of options with all the, the these different potential actions you could take, um, is essentially to, to, instead of creating a larger number of different options just make it so that you, the number of options you do have have more potential applications um so essentially by making the the mechanics a little bit more flexible instead of just trying to define every um edge case of actions you 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 are more likely to know what you're going to do and then just be able to leverage and then choose how to do it to best leverage your action. Um, so that's some, something like, uh, you know, in, instead of defining um, tons of different parameters for how you might gain a slight advantage or disadvantage in combat, 
come up with some guidelines, some broad guidelines around how those, what all of those things fall into. So uh, it's sort of a middle ground between uh, something where you, you, you know, oversimplify into a mechanic that is uh, something like advantage in D&D, right? Mm-hmm. Um, where everything is just advantage, and so it it basically doesn't matter what you do, like, because regardless, it's going to be advantage or disadvantage, and you can't get any multiple times, so it there's no there's no scaling level of how good something is. If someone's fallen over, it's the same as if they're blind. Um, so, uh, so you, you don't really, I think that that's a little too far on the one thing that's that's highly applicable and highly flexible side, but you also don't want to define, you know, individually the difference between someone having the sun in their eyes and someone uh, being, you know, disadvantaged because they're on lower ground or something like that because it's overly complicated and you end up thinking too much about the situation and overanalyzing it. Um, so we kind of have a few broad categories that all of these things will fall into. Um, and so uh, we have like a few levels of obscurity, for example, um, and the level of obscurity is a, a, a well-defined mechanic and it's, you know, we, we design it to be kind of fairly simple and easy to remember, but also widely applicable so that it, you know, you can use the, the same obscurity for being blinded by light can also work by being blinded by darkness or fog. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so, so it makes it easier, and you don't have to spend as much time analyzing the situation, but also know that you can kind of accumulate benefits uh, that that stack. Um, you know, someone can be disadvantaged both because the area is obscured and because uh, they are deaf or some other effect. Mm-hmm. Now. With the, with that in mind, is adv- is advancement on a on a on a XP as currency kind of approach? Uh, no. So it's uh essentially every attribute uh, has its own what you might call like an XP pool, mm-hmm. um, and that attribute's XP pool is progressed through a character using that attribute. Um. So one of the nice things about this is it means that your character, you know, gets better in the ways that you use them, which means that uh, the, the the way that you role play a character and the way that they function mechanically will tend to align um, over time. Because you know, if you're playing a character as a very outgoing and charismatic character, their charisma will become better because of it, and they will get better at doing that. Um, so it kind of helps players, you know play to their strengths and also uh, encourages them to, to stay in character more. But um, yeah, so, and then, and then once that, uh, once the, you, you gain a level, so to speak, in a given attribute, um, the number increases and then you gain an ability in it as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So with, with that, with that in mind, um, when it com- when when it comes to when it comes to um, abilities, um, I'm guess I'm guessing that I'm guessing that each because each one because each ability is tied to is tied to one of the abilities tied to one of the um, uh, attributes. Um, is it a, is it a ca- would the would the abilities themselves be be more akin to feats in um, Pathfinder? Um, they, it's, it's definitely a mix and it, uh, kind of depends on, they're, they're similar. Yes. So they're, they're definitely similar. Um, and Pathfinder has a lot of feats that are sort of static increases. Uh, and we kind of tried to go with a little bit more horizontal progression instead of purely vertical progression. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's the the abilities are fairly similar to something like feats in Pathfinder. And to that to that end, um, one of the big is- one of the big um, issues that's that's been a, that's been my whipping boy for years when it comes to the feat system in both D and D third edition and Pathfinder is one the traps 
um, and two, the um, the requ the requirements on certain feet chains, also, or as I've sometimes called it, pay to not suck. With um, Whirlwind Attack being the um, poster child for this kind of thing, um, <laughs> when it comes to the when it comes to the abilities, I'm <clears throat> guessing most of them are fairly self-contained. There's not a whole lot of chain-based approaches, or a whole or a whole lot of um, a whole lot of prerequisites for the, for them. Uh, yeah. So there, we have a few that have like a prerequisite. Um but they're not very long chains. Uh, we'll have, you know, maybe one ability will have a prerequisite of one other ability, such as um, the, the, like, the ability that gives you the, the, uh, lets you cast spells is called the caster ability. Some things will have a prerequisite of that because you need to be able to cast spells for them. Um, but yeah, for the most part, try to avoid things that are like very chain-based where you have to, like, you have to get in on at one point in order to get this whole progression system. We wanted it to be very very free form where, where players were really able to design kind of whatever they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so so yeah, we, we shied mostly away from ability chains. Um, uh, and yeah. Uh, the, the prerequisites are all for the most part uh, with the exception of those few abilities where it's like you you have to have something like the caster ability or uh, something like that. Then they mostly just have a prerequisite of a certain number in that attribute. So essentially, uh, as your um, attribute increases, you unlock more options for what you could choose. Um, and it's a higher level. There's sort of we we have a little bit of a design philosophy around this, which is. Uh, you know, at the the very beginning abilities that you're starting with, you're sort of just you're building something that's that's going to be you know fairly basic. Um, uh, where you've got you know if you build if you if you start with a good bit of strength, you and you put your first couple abilities there into strength, then you end up with something that looks like a, a pretty normal fighter. Mm -hmm. um, but then as you progress strength, uh, you can turn that into you know these these subgenres of fighter. And then, as you progress, some other your your other attributes as well. The uh, abilities you take in your strength pool will synergize with those other ability pools to create something that's like highly unique. Um, so, yeah. Now, with with that in mind, I also wanted to ask about the um, the checks when it comes to expertise. Um, is that is are those is expertise your um your equ your equivalent to the standard skill system? Uh, expertise is uh, yeah. So there's there's a set of skills um which we just have as checks mm -hmm. um and uh, expertise is would be equivalent to proficiency for Pathfinder or D and D essentially. Um, it it mechanically works different but that would be a pretty close approximation of what it does is it is it a case where you where you'd um if you're using that skill and you have expertise you'd roll with advantage or something like that uh it just it's a simple uh so you don't roll with advantage in it uh we don't have advantage or anything but it, it's a it's a it's a numerical increase so essentially normally for any given uh skill you would add the associated attribute to your role because, you know, like, e even if you have no training in uh, athletics checks, you're going to be better at athletics the higher your strength becomes. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be the normal, normal case. And then if you have expertise in it and then you sort of have trained to do this specific thing, then instead you just add 1.5 times your... Uh, associated attribute, so essentially you're, you're always going to be 50% better, and then the, mm -hmm. the better you get, the more the more that increase is. So essentially, uh, someone who is maxed out their, their strength at 10 um, and also has uh, uh, someone who has their, their, their maxed out strength at 10 and also has expertise in athletics is going to be you know, enormously better than someone who's just maxed out their strength and doesn't have that. And at the 
Whereas at the low level, it's just a bonus of plus one. So it's essentially like this idea that you're continuously learning, and then by the end, you have sort of mastered this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. with, so take, taking taking that into taking that into account, um, one thing one thing that I I was cur I was curious about because some ga some games have this matter. A bit at the er a bit at the early stage of, of of play, but 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 by mid or late game, it doesn't matter as much. Let's let's talk about species. Um, yeah. Two things. One, how much of how what is what is your choice of species um, factor in factor into during character creation, and to, and two, um. Do you are you plan are you planning on putting um, some sort of system to create custom feet to create custom species a la the old savage species um, book back in third edition um yes so good questions uh, the uh, your, your species matters for a few reasons so um, for one every species has their own set of traits. Uh, which are these, you know, innate abilities that you're going to gain, um, and I wanted, and and for all of these, I want them to be one of them to be something that doesn't uh, lose relevance as you progress. Um, so they're they're all kind of designed to scale um, with with time. So they're not they're not generally something that's going to be a flat out um, like damage increase or something because those sort of lose relevance as you become a higher level character so to speak mm -hmm. uh so there there are things like um uh like for example one of the the, the species that we added for our stretch goal uh is this sort of half dead creature um and they have this uh ability to basically uh, if they if they die if they fail a death save, um, they can they they have a grace period before they are actually killed, um, which is uh, during which time they, there's they they're able to be revived um, in a in a certain way. Um, so uh, things like that, which which remain relevant, whether you know if you're if you're level one, uh, you die easily and that's super useful and if you're at high level and you're fighting something that's you know a big deal it's all it's it's equally useful um so we wanted to keep species your, what species you choose relevant um throughout your the, the game um because by making the the things you gain through it something that you'll both have ample opportunity to use um potentially and also something that won't be pointless by the time by at a given stage, mm -hmm. um, and then the second thing you get with it is uh, you get you start off with an initial attribute distribution. Um, this is a, an optional rule; uh, it's the way that I kind of prefer to run the game, uh, but I didn't include it as in the main rules because of it's it's a little bit more to keep track of, and uh, for new players, as particularly those who are like new to tabletop role playing overall, uh, I just wanted to keep everything accessible, so. Uh, you know, an optional rule is that your maximum in each attribute is de dependent on your initial attribute distribution. Um, so basically, what species you start as determines how good you can get in something overall um, uh, if you use that rule uh, as well. So that's kind of the, the big ways that, 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 plays, uh, that your species plays a role. Speaking of distribution, um, given the given the background you have with um, D and D, you're probably already already somewhat familiar with um, rent with random distribution, which um, right. some some people prefer using, some people some people don't. Um, is that is that an, is that an option, or is it going to be strictly point based? Uh, so it is almost all the way point based. Um, uh, you know, with with the core progression system being tied to attributes, uh, we can really just have someone be rolling attributes and then happening to be essentially higher level than the other players. Um, 
So it's it's purely point based. Uh, you could do something where you you roll a random number to add if you wanted, but uh, the attributes are purely point based. And then we have one uh, stat um, called luck, and luck is rolled. Um, but besides that, it's all point based. And with the with that kind of, with that kind of thing in mind, um, as as I as I understand it, based on based on what based on what I've seen, um, when it comes to action economy, instead of do instead of doing a st a standard move free and and so on, or a or a standard move and and um, free and bonus in um f in five e, um, you're using a point based system with EP. Ah, so, um, yes and no. So that we, we have sort of your, your main actions are a sort of slotted system where you have a major action and a minor action and a reaction and, and that. Um, the EP is more, is, is semi-equivalent to something like hit points. Um, uh, is essentially you're, you're mostly going to use it to evade and things, but it does also give you some options. Uh, besides that, you you can expend it for other purposes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, most of those purposes are things you'll unlock as you gain abilities. Um, uh, yeah, so so most of those are things you'll unlock as you gain abilities. Uh, like, for example, uh, you could choose to turn your minor action into a major action by expending EP um, and do things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for for the most part, you're not expending it all the time, uh, and you can also additionally, whenever you use it to evade, you can also move a number of feet equal to the amount of EP you've expended. Um, so this is uh, kind of uh, the 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 in, the reason for this is kind of twofold. Uh, for one, it gives you some more flexibility in your positioning, because positioning plays a larger role in Apotheosis than a lot of other uh, TRPGs. Um, uh, and so the idea of having made like a saving throw to reduce how bad it is, but that doesn't have any tangible effect on the gameplay, because you You just kind of remain in the same place. <laughs> like, like what, what is what does that indicate, really? Um, so with this, it's it's a, we kind of want to bridge that disconnect. Um, so you know, if you expend uh, and an area of effect, the instance of area of effect, you you actually generally need to then use the EP that you expend to move yourself to the outside of the affected area. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, it kind of the the gameplay of it matches up with the sort of narrative side um, where you you actually have to like throw yourself out of the way of the explosion or or something like that and then a saving throw indicates that you know you were able to see it coming beforehand and so it was a little bit easier for you to get out of the way mm -hmm. um, so yeah now with the, with that in with that in mind um I'd like to shift into into the ma into the magic question ag again for a sim for a similar but different um, reason than I did before. Um, when you look at the when you look when you look when you look at the way magic systems work in a lot of different a lot of different games, a lot of them obviously are not using the va the Vancian approach that we've seen for the longest time in Dungeons and Dragons. Or they, or they, um, or they just simply would not fit that particular. Taking taking that into account, um, do you have a do you have a means within the system for um, creating the magic system that would be used by a, by a given setting? Um, 
Yeah, so we have kind of a mixed approach on this um, between the two main schools of, you know, either there's this list of spells and each spell does like this one thing, uh, which you'd see in something like D&D uh, for the most part, or the kind of make your own magic uh, that you we see in some other newer tabletop role playing games, or old, um, or, st- or stuff like Mage. Yeah, right, right. Um, yeah, uh, and so our our kind of the way we've gone with it is it is you've you've got this list of spells mm-hmm. um, that do certain things, but they're more uh, the, the way that the spells themselves are written is to try and you know, reward players using them creatively and finding these creative applications. Um, uh, because, and essentially, the, re- the reason we didn't go fully for something like uh, you'd see in, in Major, one of these more uh, make-your-own-spells kind of things, um, for one, it was a, a matter of the accessibility of it that it's, you know, definitely more complicated to get into uh, as a new player. Uh, and the second was that... Uh, a lot of them, uh, I think frequently you, you kind of end up with uh, sort of illusion of choice problems uh, with those systems uh, in that to, you know, keep them balanced, you're kind of limited to these set of, you, you're, you're essentially just mixing effects mm-hmm. um, where, you know, you, it doesn't really fulfill the idea of like really creating your own spell in my mind um, and has its own, set of balancing hurdles and complexity to overcome. So we kind of went with these spells that are more you know this spell, but the spell isn't super limited. Um, and the example I like to use for this is uh, if you take the spell uh, Cloud of Daggers for d d um, it's like super weird in, in, the, in the narrative sense. Um, because uh, if you if you encountered a character in a fantasy novel or something, um, and when you f- when you meet this character, they are seen conjuring this cloud of swirling daggers that slice up an enemy. Uh, you would probably expect that at some other point in the book they will do something else that involves daggers, right? Like they, they like they're not limited to only controlling daggers in this one way that they can kind of more broadly. Uh, control them. Um, what you see in the kind of move towards hard magic systems um, that has been in, in modern fantasy, where more modern fantasy is generally leaning towards using harder magic systems, um, where you know the, the, the reader understands what the rules of this, this thing are and can imagine their own uses for it and see how it's used more as a problem-solving tool than as a uh, unknown question mark that sometimes does things. Um, so we went with uh, kind of designing spells around that philosophy, where, uh, you know, and that maybe the best way to do this is just to kind of give an example. Um, we've got, uh, you know, spells or bounds on it, um, where it's like you can't do this or you or whatever you, you can attempt anything um, with the, the caveat that if you're doing something that moves that that changes the orientation of your vibe organs or uh, something like that, you have to make a medicine check in order to see if you basically are knowledgeable enough to do it without killing yourself. Mm-hmm. So uh, we kind of lean towards things like that. And then uh, to you know add more flexibility to it, where you do even on top of that kind of get to create your own magic system or, or, or make the spells work differently for your character. Um, you can take abilities that will alter the way that your spells work. Uh, so, if, if for the example of um, uh, transmute itself, uh, if you take the alchemist ability, mm-hmm. you gain the then then you're able to take elements 
from the environment around you and incorporate them into your body, right? So then you can do things like uh, create, you know, like you could give yourself, for example, the same effect as stone skin or something similar to that um, without that being something that's explicitly written into the book. So you do get to sort of create your own magic, but it is out of these predetermined spells um, that just have more flexible applications. Yeah. Now, in the in that magic system, you there were a few there were a few particular names uh, names and um, series that you had you had re you had reference. So I'd like to pick your brain on on that specifically and how those particular systems would be adapted into apotheosis apotheosis's Jeez, try saying that five times fast. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, sandbox. So, um, for since you, since you, since you had brought it up, I'll go I'll go with the, I'll go with the first one and, the, and a relatively easy one with the um with the spell use in Harry Potter. Yep. Uh oh, like how? So how would you know? Uh. Harry Potter like spells exist in, in apotheosis. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So so this is it, this was um, one of the, we really want to make sure that you know you could do that where you, you could kind of like pick a particular fantasy character that you like and you could kind of emulate the way that they function. Um, for Harry Potter, uh, for Harry Potter, it's pretty easy. Uh, you know, those are mostly based off of like you know the right words, and then you 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 say them, and you do this thing. And if you're a really advanced uh, spellcaster, then you can you know maybe do it without words or without a wand. Um, so uh, yeah, and and then you you know some particular set of spells, um, and so it's pretty easy. You you would basically the the sort of default uh, caster progression for apotheosis would kind of lead you into something that's Harry Potter-esque, where uh, you learn more and more spells, and then uh, you could potentially take an ability that would allow you to uh, expend a little bit more mana and cast them, you know, maybe without using verbal components or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, so so Harry Potter would be would be fairly easy. It, it would almost be sort of natural in the way that you'd your your first glance at the way that the uh, the spell progression system works, you'd probably end up with a caster that looks something like Harry Potter. Yeah. Um, the ne the next one I want I'd want to ask is um, Kaladin Stormblessed from the Stormlight Archive, which um, I'll give I'll give you I'll give you a few cool points for re for referencing that um, series. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so. Uh, Brandon Sanderson is, you know, one of my favorite uh, fantasy authors, um, and so I can kind of help myself, but work some of his ideas into the game. Um, uh, yeah, so to make him to, to make something like Kaladin, uh, and in my opinion, Kaladin functions a little bit more like you would see sort of a superhero mm -hmm. function, where they have a very defined number of abilities, um, and then they use these abilities in very interesting ways. Um, so, particularly with Kaladin, you would take the spell uh, Gravitational Locality, which would give you the ability to essentially change the direction that gravity pulls on you, um, which is how, uh, within that book, he emulates flight, um, and is also one of the ways that you can emulate flight within Apotheosis, uh, is to do something like a, a Gravitational Locality. Um, uh, beyond that, you also have his uh, the idea of you know he has his summonable uh, sword, which can also take the form of other items and weapons. Um, and our solution to that is a spell conjure item, uh, which allows you to create an object up to a certain uh, weight and size, um, and then as long as you're holding the object, essentially, you can continuously change its form into other things as a minor action. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, those are kind of his, his main abilities. You could also go into his further progression uh, by, you know, taking 
uh, there's a few ways you could solve for, say, his like shard plate uh, within the system. You could either go with something like the alter self, where you're like creating shard plate out of the environment, or you could go with something like just uh, you know mage armor um, type solution. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, uh, and then besides that, he would basically just be uh, he, he would be sort of one of the mixed fighter and spellcaster builds that you could do, where you're you're boosting up your your strength abil- uh, strength abilities alongside your intelligence abilities probably um as a as a corollary to that um how would you how would you handle the the rules when it comes to stormlight as well as how the um, immortal words work immortal words ah yeah so um yeah so the uh I assume but that you mean sort of like the, the oaths that you speak for yes. your progression. Yeah. So the your 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 oaths, so to speak, uh that would mostly be left up to sort of a role playing decision. Like, you know, when you got um an attribute increase and so the way that that's specifically built into the, the game so that you could emulate something like the more uh, the, the, the oaths, um, is in uh, one of our the, the, the optional progression systems. So uh, instead of using the, the strict whenever you gain um, attributes or whenever you use an ability, you're gaining a certain number of points and then that's eventually causing your attribute to increase. Uh, there's an alternative progression system in which by performing a feat of greatness in some sense, and that's kind of you know left up to the GM's discretion, but when when a character does something particularly heroic or good, then they're given a number of progression points that could potentially boost one of their attributes. Um, so within the the context of you know the Stormlight Archive, you gen- the characters are gaining uh, the ability to say their their new oaths in sort of these moments of high tension and these moments where they've you know done something to earn it. Um, and so if you used the alternate progression system for the you know great feat based is what we call it progression. Uh, then you could emulate that sort of uh, moment in which a character does something ex- you know extraordinary and or heroic, and then are given attribute points uh, that allow them to gain some new ability. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's sort of our our solution to that. Um, and as far as the uh... Did, I'm not sure if I'm not sure if you mentioned the how you'd handle um, the energy source being stormlight. Uh, yeah. So the energy source being stormlight. Um, this is so. So we use uh, you know mana, um, and this sort of ties into my my tentative later plans to make the system sci-fi compatible. Mm-hmm. Um, in the sense that uh, the the definition of mana is that you know you you basically you have a number of mana points and then you expend them to do spells and things. Um, the easy answer for for stormlight is that mana is just stormlight, and then uh, you know a month would mechanically work the same way. And depending on how you uh, dress it up in the setting you end up with it being Stormlight or it being generic mana, or if you want to go into a sci-fi setting, you could homebrew it into electricity uh, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Now, the... The, um, the third... The um, next one that I wanted to ask on, um, especially especially given some of my colleagues, is um, alchemy a la Full Metal Alchemist, since you brought up Edward Elric. And yeah, I think in this regard, I think it's important to separate the way, the way um the way alchemy traditionally works in a mestris, the way um the way the uh, the way people like the El- people like the Elrics, people like um Izu- people like Izumi, and so and so on uses it, and um how you'd possibly do alchemy. Okay, sure. uh, okay. Um, yeah. So for alchemy. Uh, the the sort of approach for that um, is, you know, you're you're primarily building your intelligence. Uh, if you're really going to make 
a true kind of Edward Elric type character, you're probably also going to either be building your dexterity or strength because he does a lot of melee fighting. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you're focusing on building up your intelligence um, and then taking the, uh, the spells that are within the transmutation domain. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so... Uh, this is your your side of your basic spells on this level is going to be things uh, your your basic transmutation just kind of lets you change the material of a certain uh, volume of an or a certain number of pounds of an of an object, um, and then you've got your, your later abilities things like transmute stone where you can take uh, I believe it's a cubic foot of stone and then turn it into a shape of your choice, um, which you know is something that you'll you'll see happening a lot in Fullmetal Alchemist. Someone will write a, their, their transmutation circle on something and then the, the stone moves into the shape that they wanted or parts or something. Um, and so then we've, we've got a set of abilities for that. And then, you know, of course, you've also got sort of different alchemists focusing, being able to transmute different types of uh, materials where they'll either be focusing generally on, uh, you know, they transmute stone, or they transmute the air, or uh, water, or uh, things like that. Um, so that kind of translates into the different spells, uh, whether you're taking something like uh, shape stone, uh, shape earth, uh, shape or, or uh, transmute water. Um, that's going to kind of give you your sort of focus, but you could also take all of them and then become more versatile, like you generally see uh, Edward to be, uh, where he's kind of just doing whatever to anything. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and then, uh, of course, by as you progress, um, you, you initially start by maybe you take these different abilities, um, but also when you reach uh, a certain spells, work better and do more. So uh, when you have that ability, whenever you do use one of the spells, it can work on twice the volume of stuff. Um, so that, you know, kind of makes you just become a more powerful alchemist. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, in terms of whether or not you need transmutation uh, circles to cast, um, there... I would I would simplify this to being the mechanic of like if I were to put this in a in a you know uh, full metal alchemist setting if I were to use it uh, apotheosis really for a full metal alchemist game um, I would say that just the the somatic components of spells is the action of drawing a transmutation circle mm -hmm. um, and then if you uh, take the ability to um, to expend extra mana in order to or extra mana or extra time in order to circumvent needing to use uh, somatic components, then you would be something. Then that would be kind of mimicking Edward, where you can just clap and do it because you no longer need the somatic components. Um, and so that's kind of that. That would be how I would envision building uh, a character like Edward. It's a little more complicated than the other ones, but uh, yeah. I, f I fig, I fig, I figured if you if you're gonna drop his name in this kind of thing, that kind of question yeah. would be inevitable. Um, right. Yeah. But what about um alkahestry, which was, which is um used as the alch as the alchemy analog in um Shing. In Shing, oh yes, uh, where you're, yeah, uh, it's for alchemy, um, yeah. So again, you could you could kind of. Uh, man, I, I haven't I haven't made a specific build for this in my head before, mm -hmm. um, uh, but you one of the things so so with them they, they kind of make the transmutation circles out of like the the thrown uh, thrown daggers uh, if uh, I remember correctly, um, and uh, there there's a so one of the the ways you could kind of approximate that is with something like a uh, and this would be, you know, because some of your, your conjuration um, spells are going to overlap with your transmutation spells, uh, or you might use something that's in the conjuration domain to uh, also approximate um, uh, a transmutation. 
So you could take the ability uh, for, and uh, right now its name is eluding me, but essentially you can attach your your conjuration spells to mundane objects and then cast them centered around that point. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, essentially that would allow you to do something like you throw some daggers into the ground and then cause, uh, you know, things to, to change or appear in that area uh, by kind of binding the spell to it. Um, so that's, you know, maybe one way in which you could approximate uh, something that's closer to Alka history um, is with that kind of spell binding ability. Yeah. Now, this now one, I've we've mentioned a we've mentioned a fair share of of the of those of um a bit of a bit more freeform setup. So I'd want to go with one that's a bit more um, structured. Um, okay. How familiar? How familiar are you with um, Dark Souls? Uh, yeah, I've played one of the games. Mm -hmm. So, what I'm what I'm specifically curious about is how you, is how you'd handle the um, ma magic in that setup. The magic in Dark Souls. Uh, okay, so from my memory, the magic in Dark Souls is um, you essentially need a certain number of uh, attribute points in some regard in order to use it at all, and then uh, you will find something like a scroll, and then you'll be able to use it as a weapon, basically, um, as long as you have it. Not, um, not, ex not exactly. You've, you got, you got half of it. Um, okay. The you first off, you have to, you have to, you have to find a spell in order to, in order to learn it. But in order to cast it, you need a um, you need a you need to use a cat you need to use a catalyst that matches the um the spe the spell's class, you know. So okay. Sorcery, pyromancy, miracles, and so and so on. And um. The and that catalyst has a set number of charges, which after you when you run out the the main way you're going to get it back is by re is through a bonfire. Okay. Um, okay. Right. So then, yeah. So I, I would probably liken the charges to being the character's mana them itself. Uh, then, where you know, because you know, by resting you're regenerating your mana, and by resting you're regenerating your your charges um, of that spell. Uh, uh, and then, in terms of uh, learning it in in that way, where you kind of have to, you you you. Um, you learn it and then have some some kind of object that your uh, is sort of like a quasi well, spell casting focus to pull a term from D and D. Um, that's you know very much possible. Uh, one one of the ways which we approximate uh, or have to kind of demonstrate a spell casting focus. Um, and there's there's ways that you could kind of create one through uh, certain abilities, such as the arcane archer ability, which would kind of turn your spell casting focus into like your bow and arrow um, but you could also uh, have a weapon such as a uh, magic channeling weapon which would allow you to essentially cast your spells through the object um, or you could say that in Dark Souls they are not uh, actually casting the spells at all and it is Weapon based, in which case there's you know items which will will have a specific spell and which also re mm -hmm. um, so kind of depending on how you look at it and how closely you wanted to approximate the way that Dark Souls works. There's a few different approaches you could take. I would say. Yeah, I I can I can get that. And the main reason that I asked that I asked that is how you'd accommodate um, magic systems that are specific around. Um, a set a set number of uses instead of re instead of relying on a on a on that kind of pool. Um, yeah. Although take although taking the pool idea, I'd like to um, I'd like to I'd, li I'd like to spin I'd like to um, put a different spin on the on the pool idea, and that is how that is how you how you would handle um, a ma how you'd handle a magic system that's akin to the whole five color setup. In Magic: The Gathering. Okay. Um. 
Okay, yeah, and so uh, and and by that do you mean just sort of where there's a few different classifications of uh, like spells that sort of go together to create a certain kit, so to speak? Yeah, the the main the cycle that I'm, the because of the fact that an MTG's main um main cycle is ta is um is ta is tapping is tapping lands to generate mana and then spending um co combinations of mana for um for spells art artifacts um and the uh, summons and the like. Right. Um. Okay. Yeah. So the way that I would think of that is uh, essentially you your your tapping of mana land uh in uh magic the gathering would be your you know using it up mm -hmm. um and then the ending of your turn would be sort of i mean it, it's a little hard to say for magic the gathering because of the fact that that's sort of a more of a war game type thing where you're not really playing as a character in the same sense uh i mean you you kind of are within the canon but within the, the mechanics you're more commanding a army um uh, but uh, the the way that I would liken that is essentially your your mana your 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 turn is the time between your resting and your tapping of mana is your consuming mana uh, within apotheosis and then um, you essentially would probably uh, be mainly taking spells that are within a conjuration domain um, because you're mostly going to be you know, summoning creatures and things like that. Uh, and then maybe having a few that are, like, the spells uh, within magic that are, that are temporary um, that are effects, like uh, creating fire and to kill something or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I mean, even within that, there, there are also zero cost. Uh, there, there are spells within Apotheosis that have no mana cost um, that would be similar also in some sense, to Magic the Gathering, where you know you have certain cards that don't have a associated mana cost. Yeah. Um, yeah. The the main reason that I asked is is uh, is on the on the on the concept of of um essentially, essentially mana pool from a value into um into into separate values by these different colors. Right. Oh. Um, yeah, so by the different colors, uh, the, for the different colors, I, I would maybe, uh, I would probably liken that maybe to the domains within the game, so that each, each, uh, spell has different domains, and within, um, uh, magic, the different spells are divided into, uh, the different color groups, which have kind of cohesive ways that they work, like the, um, black color is generally going to be like you've got your like your death related cards and there's kind of this whole synergy that goes along with that deck mm -hmm. um which is also something that's similar for apotheosis with the different domains where uh depending on which, which domain of magic it is uh you have you you can you can you know kind of build to make that domain better potentially uh with stuff like the alchemist ability that we talked about uh but also uh, if you take multiple abilities uh, or multiple spells from the same domain, they will have some kind of cohesive uh, build to them. You'll, you'll kind of you'll kind of, and and in fact, one of our uh, abilities um, for becoming you know kind of essentially gives you the the ability to cast spells through a god instead of through a uh, dev through more traditional like wizard type means so you know it's kind of like being a cleric instead of a wizard um if you take that ability then you're actually limited to having spells only from two domains so then you kind of end up with these sub <laughs> caster builds where you're you're kind of just looking at the, at, at a certain group of spells and and synergizing between them mm -hmm. now with with all with all of that in mind, one other um one other aspect that I that I wanted to I want that I wanted to pick your brain on given given the customization that you're aiming for is is customizability when it comes to weapons 
because mm. um obvi obviously trying to do a comprehensive weapon list even for even for a european fantasy game is going to be is going to be pushing it right and given some of the cr given some of the crazy ass weapons and and the like that have that have pro that have propped up in anime or video games or, or the like over the years um it's one it's one of those things that that I think is I think is worth um digging into. Is that something that's been on the table? Uh yeah, uh very much uh improving kind of the the weapons in the game was a big um another thing we really wanted to to get right. Um so we have a pretty wide array of weapons. We got uh, a little bit more than 40 different weapon options, I believe. Um but also wanted them to actually like we wanted your weapon choice to matter, essentially. Um, whereas, if you're, you know, playing something, uh, a lot of tabletop role-playing games, you can kind of choose from a whole lot of different weapon names that do the exact same things. Uh, we wanted to, you know, give a lot of weapons, you know, unique and different properties. Um, you know, so so you can kind of, depending on what weapon you choose, you even that that can even play a role in your build and and give you a uh, different capability. So um, generally, we kind of tried to have things progress along. The weapon that you're choosing, it's kind of going to be a trade-off between uh, your damage, the weight, and the reach. Uh, but also, a lot of weapons will have things like special abilities, like uh, we have a tri-bladed dagger, um, which is you know basically like a, a dagger that sort of has three edges and has been twisted. Uh, if you want to look that up for a reference for anyone who doesn't uh, know, but uh, and it has this ability or, or this um, property called killer, where essentially, uh, if it's used to wound a creature, the creature has minus three to its death save. So it's it makes it you know significantly more deadly, um, which is why you may or may not choose it over, say, a normal dagger. Um, where, you know, with a normal dagger, it's, you know, less cost, or you could choose a push dagger where you've got less weight and you have a bonus against being disarmed. So you kind of can, even just within the daggers, um, you can kind of choose the way that you want to tailor your build um, based on the weapon that you're using. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, the, the way that we treat magic items uh, is kind of, I think, a gets more in depth into the 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 customizability um, where generally instead of treating uh, magic items as an item that has a property um, uh, we kind of go more with a uh, build a bear workshop type approach where you sort of take there's there's a list of magical effects that could be on an item, and then you know the GM is going to either randomly generate one, um, in the uh, which we have a series of tables for in the back of the book, uh, or you know specifically create one out of these effects to make it you know work in some unique and interesting way, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so you know that'll include anything from. It can be, uh, you know, something like it's plus one and also can cast this spell, or it's uh, a returning weapon where you can, you know, summon it back to your hand, and also uh, it can turn, it, uh, and also it's a um, a shrinkable weapon where it's it it becomes small, you know, so that it's more easily carried and easily hidden or stowed away, um, or you know, maybe you want to shrink it and throw it and turn it into a dagger and then bring it back to your hand and then turn it back into a claymore. Um, you know, so you can kind of, by, by mixing and matching these different uh, magical item properties, you can create weapons that do a lot of unique and interesting things. Mm -hmm. um, um, this might be, this might be a, as my dumb question of the night, but um, how would you make a gun blade in that scenario? <laughs> <laughs> Gunplay. We actually had someone uh, asking about that uh, the other day on the, on the Discord. Uh, the, the way that I would probably make Gunblade, and uh, again, right now the game is 
everything that's like in the game at the moment is all very fantasy setting. Um, uh, but uh, within that, the way that I would probably make a Gunblade is a uh, the, the the property of a zero cost staff, where essentially it has a certain number of magical charges, um, where it can cast a certain spell a number of times, mm-hmm. uh, and also it is. Uh, maybe uh, either either it's something like a, a shrinkable weapon where you know it's you, you shrink it down and it's something like a dagger and then you can cast a you know bolt of energy out of it that would be you could dress up to to, to say it's a bullet um, uh, and then it's sort of again blade and then you can you can it kind of grows and turns into a, a big sword or you could choose something like a uh uh, uh, m- magical uh, 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 our, our mega sword, um, which is one of the the magical properties, uh, which is essentially, uh, you know, kind of just throw that on there on top of it being like a shrinkable, casting a spell type uh, weapon, and then also it turns into something that's. You know, absurdly large, uh, which the Mega Sword is essentially the solution to the big anime sword that you want to use in D anD D, but doesn't make sense. So it's just a really oversized weapon that is uh, magically enchanted to be lighter, and then you gain uh, it functions in this kind of unique way within the game. So then you can turn, you can have your sort of uh, bazooka uh, sword <laughs> if you wanted to also give it another magical property. Oh, all right. I can, I can, I can see where I can see where that's working with. Um, with all that in mind, what would you be shooting for for a release window? Uh, we're almost really so. Uh, we will. Uh, our Kickstarter is ending in, uh, I believe, eight days, uh, seven days now, um, and the we'll we'll begin shipping out uh, PDFs of the game as soon as. Uh, the Kickstarter is over, mm-hmm. uh, and then uh, we've already sent the manuscript to get printed, um, and then physical copies of the the book will be start getting sent out shortly after. Um, as soon as uh, uh, shortly after we get them back, <laughs> basically. So um, yeah, so we're looking at people will pe- first people will probably be getting their physical copies in. Uh, of November, um, me beginning of November time range will probably be the first physical one, and then the first digital will be beginning of October. Mm-hmm. And I, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how that develops. Um, and I want, I do want to offer my congratulations for for um, getting several times over your initial goal since it's at the time of this recording at eight point three thousand. Um, when you're yes, only asking you. for two thousand. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's been it's been really great to see how uh, interested people have been in the game and the the sort of reception to it mm-hmm. um, has been wonderful. So, but with all, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. <laughs> and. Anytime you see fit, to re- great, thank you for having me. Anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Excellent. Uh, thanks very much. Mm-hmm. As uh, appreciate the opportunity to come on here and uh, sort of talk about uh, <laughs> the thing I've been creating for <laughs> forever. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, great. Thank you very much. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!